our devotional scripture will be coming from Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. We've come a long way to get to where we are today. So let us remember those who paved the way for our freedom, those who fight against injustice yeah. and for the oppression that we as African Americans had to endure. Yeah. Today, we have a story to tell. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we give our praise and glory to your most holy name, Father God. We bless your holy name this morning, Father God. Father, you God, you have brought us from a mighty long way, God, and, and we just come this morning to just give you thanks, Father God. We, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father God. We thank you for your love, for your mercy. Father God, we thank you for your grace. Your grace has brought us this far. It is by faith, Lord God, that, that, that we have made it this far. By faith, Lord, in you, Lord. Father God, we just pray, Lord God, that you will give us strength, power, courage, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, yes. Lord God, as we continue along this journey yes. called life. Mm. Amen. 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 Break out, Linda. While I stretch my hand to thee. <laughs> Thomas Moss to James Bird, 
and from Marie Scott to Mary Turner. African Americans have paid the ultimate price because of the skin we are wrapped in. All the while, America's history has all but forgotten the families that were left behind to tell the story. Share the pain and provide proof that although Africans built this country, they also bear the pain of its hurt. Moreover, on this third Sunday of February, the month that is set aside to honor this rich history, we the survivors power our class, invite you to open your hearts and minds to our past while we tell the story of how lynching has stained the history of this country. We are glad that you've decided to share with us on this day, because tomorrow it will be our history. Thank you. Good morning, July. Good morning. My job this morning is to give you the origin of lynching. Lynching is a derivative term that was taken from the name of Colonel Charles Lynch, who was a landowner in Virginia in 1790. Lynch had a habit of holding illegal trials of local lawbreakers in his front yard. Upon conviction of the accused, Lynch took to whipping the suspects while they were tied to a tree in front of his house. Over time, this practice became known as simply lynching. Although mistreatment of slaves was common throughout the early part of the 19th century, lynching was, set, was a separate practice apart from slavery. The term lynching refers only to the concept of vigilantism, in which citizens would assume the role of judge, jury, and executioner. Vigilante groups were common during the last half of the 19th century and were fed by a strong notion that the existing laws were not functioning properly, resulting in criminals, especially black criminals, being set free at the expense of the public. The United States has a brutal history of domestic violence. It is an ugly episode in our national history that has been that has been long been ne ne I'm sorry neglected. Yeah. Of the several varieties of American violence, one stands out as one of the most inhuman chapters in history of the world: the violence committed against Negro citizens in America by white people. In his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, James Cone, the founder of Black Liberation Theology, discusses history of lynching, mostly in the southern states, and the daily threat of violence and death black space by lynching every day. He writes about how whites had a mob mentality and also used mob violence as a means to bear seniority over blacks. There was an increase in lynching after the Civil War and the end of slavery. When the 1867 con Congress passed the Re Reconstruction Act, granting black men the franchise and citizenship rights of participation in the affairs of the government, <clears throat> most Southern whites were furious at the idea of granting ex-slaves social, political, and economic freedom. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866 as a means to make sure that white men would still have seniority in America, mm -hmm. the basis of white power and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Blacks had some military and northern sympathizer protection during Reconstruction, but it just made the Klan wreak their havoc and chaos in the darkness. Cone wrote about the lynching spectacles. Public spectacles were often announced in advance in newspapers and broadcast over radios. Spectacle lynchings attracted people from nearby cities and towns. They could, not, they could not have happened with our widespread knowledge and the explicit sanction of local and state authorities with the approval, with the approval from the federal government, the members of the white media, churches, and universities. White Southerners lost the Civil War, but they, but they did not lose the Cultural War. The struggle to define America as a white nation and blacks as a subordinate race, unfit for governing and therefore incapable of political and social equality. Cone proclaims lynching 
was the white community's way of forcibly reminding blacks of their inferiority and powerlessness. To be black meant that whites could do anything to you and your people, and nothing could be done about it. The actual process of lynching was morbid and incredibly violent. Lynching does not necessarily mean hanging. It often included humiliation, torture, burning, dismemberment, and castration. Oh my God. Victims were beaten and whipped, and many, many times in front of large crowds that sometimes numbered in the thousands. Cold tar was frequently used to douse the unfortunate mm. victim prior to setting him afire. Onlookers sometimes fired rifles and handguns hundreds of times into the corpse while people cheered and children played during the festivities. Cone also examined the numerous ways black women suffered in the South, totally separate from the experiences of the black man. Cone cites, although women constitute only 2% of blacks actually being killed by lynching, it would be a mistake to assume that violence against women was not widespread and brutal. Mm -hmm. Black women suffered when black men suffered and when black men did. Mm -hmm. Black women were not a threat to Southern whites. This explains why most of the victims of lynching were black men. Mm -hmm. Cone writes, the black woman not only suffered the loss of their sons, husbands, brothers, uncles, nephews, and cousins, but also endured public insults. Because black women did not have the economic means to support their families in the racist South. They were left alone and had to assume the responsibility of being head of household, not having the option to just up and leave when they felt like it. During this time in our history, we could have been destroyed as a people we struggled and showed through our faith in God's mercy, our suffering was not in vain. I agree with Cone that modern churches and society have moved away from the pain and devastation caused by lynching. There were no apologies or regrets stated, and no attempt to reestablish relationships with the African American community. We must acknowledge this era in all communities. It seems to me that until white America acknowledges and repents for the past, the past will continue to be suppressed. The African American co community should also acknowledge the evils of white supremacy, especially in modern society, because it is currently under a covert mask. Our future is not far from our past. This could easily happen again, and it has. Born a slave in 1862, Ida B. Wells was the youngest daughter of James and Lizzie Wells. The Wells family, as well as the rest of the slaves in the Confederate South, were freed uh, by the Emancipation Proclamation six months after she was born. Uh, however, living in Mississippi as African American, they faced racial prejudices and were restricted by discriminatory rules and practices. Ida B. Wells were active in the Republican Party during Reconstruction. Her father, James, was involved with the Freedmen's Aid Society and founded Shaw University, a school for newly freed blacks, now Russ College. This is where Ida B. Wells received her, her early schooling, but she had to stop, drop out at the age of 16, which tragedy <coughs> struck, her family, struck her family. Her parents and one sibling died in the yellow fever outbreak 
and she had to uh, le leaving her to care for the rest of her siblings. Ever resourceful, she convinced a nearby country school administrator she was 18 and landed a job as a teacher. In 1882, Wells moved her assistants to Memphis, Tennessee to live with an aunt. Her brothers found work as carpenter apprentices. For a time, Wells continued her education at Fisk University in Nashville. A daughter of slaves, Ida B. Wills was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi on July 16, 1862. A journalist, Wells led an anti lynching crusade in the United States in the 1890s and went on to found and become integral in groups striving for African American justice. train ride from Memphis to Nashville in May 1884, well reached the turning point in her life. Wells reached the turning point. Having brought a first class train ticket to Nashville, she was outraged when the train crew ordered her to move to the African American car and she refused on principle. As she was forcibly removed from the train, she bit one of the men on the hand. Wells sued the railroad, winning a $500 settlement in a circuit court case. However, the decision was later overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. <laughs> this injustice led to Ida B. Wells to pick up a pen to write about the issues of race and politics in the South. Using the moniker Lola, a number of her articles were published <clears throat> in black newspapers and periodicals. Well, event Wells eventually became an owner of the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, and later of the Free Speech. <laughs> well, working on working as a journalist and a publisher, Wells also held a position as a teacher in a segregated uh, public school in Memphis. She became a vocal critic and conditions a condition of working of, of blacks on all the in the city of, in the city. In, 19, in 1891, she was fired as she was fired from her job from these attacks. She championed an, another cause after the murder of her friends and his two business associates. In 1892, these three African American men, Tom Moss, Calvin McDougal. McDoug and Will Stewart set up a grocery store in the Memphis. These three business, these three business, these their new business drew customers away from the white owned and store in the neighborhood, and the white store owners and his supporters. His supporters clashed with the three men on few occasions. One night, Moss and the other guard, others guarded the store against the attack and ended up and ended up shooting several of the white vandals. Mm. They they were arrested and brought to jail, but they didn't have a chance to defend themselves against the, against the charges. Yeah. A lynch mob took them from their cells and murdered them. These brutal these brutal killings. These brutal killings, I mean, these brutal killings, mm -hmm. and Cindy Wells leading to her, to her right article, to her to write articles, mm -hmm. decrying and dimension of her friends, the wonderful death of another African American, mm -hmm. putting her own life at risk, and spent two mm -hmm. months traveling to south to the south, gathering information of on another lynch incident. One editorial scene to push some of the city, city's mm -hmm. whites over edge. A mob store stormed, stormed the office of the new of the newspaper, destroying all of the of, of her intercourse and fortunately Wells had been traveling to New York City at the time she was warned that she would be killed if she ever returned to Memphis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Set by the ban on African American exhibitors at the 1893 Wales Columbia Exposition, Wales penned and circulated a pamphlet entitled The Reason Why the Colored American is Represented in the Wales Columbia Exposition. This effort was funded and supported by the famed abolitionist and freed slave Frederick Douglass <coughs> and lawyer and editor Ferdinand Barney. Also in 1893, Wales published a red record, a personal examination of lynchings in America. In 1898, Wills brought her anti-lynching campaign to the White House, leading a protest in Washington, D.C., and calling for President William McKinley to make reforms. She married Ferdinand Burnett, Barnett that same year, and was therefore known as Ida B. Wills Barnett. While the couple eventually had four children together, Wells remained committed to her social and political activities. <coughs> well, what did she do in her later years? <coughs> Ida B. Wells established several civil rights organizations. In 1896, she formed the National Association of Colored Women. After brutal assaults on the African American community in Springfield, Illinois, in 1908, Wells sought to take action. The following year, she attended a special conference for the organization that will later become known as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Though she is considered a founding member of the NAACP, Wells later cut ties with the organization. She explained her decision thereafter, stating that she felt the organization in its infamy at the time she, felt, at the time she left had led action-based initiatives. Work, working on behalf of all women, Wells, as a part of her work with the National Equal Rights League, called for President Woodrow Wilson to put an end to discriminatory hiring practices for government jobs. She created the first African-American kindergarten in her community and fought for women's suffrage. In 1930, Wells made an unsuccessful bid for the state Senate. Health problems plagued her the following year. Ida B. Wells died of kidney disease on March 25, 1931, at the age of 69 in Chicago, Illinois. She left behind an impressive legacy of social and political he heroism. With her writing speeches and protests, Wells fought against prejudices, no matter what potential danger she faced. She once said, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Mm.
Because this is where they would take the black men and they would hang them. Mm. The elders from my, not only my home church, but surrounding church would go there and check in the morning time mm. 
to see if anyone had been home and to cut them down. These are the stories that they made sure that we knew as children. We would walk up that hill and they would show us that tree and make sure that we knew what went on on the hill. As we got older and development came in, that tree was cut down. There was a home built in the very spot in which that tree once stood. Strangely enough, there has not been a permanent residence in that home since it's built. That's one of the counts of lynching, but being with my family, being with the elders of my community, there are numerous accounts for lynching. But one that stands out, and his home for me is probably was told, not was, it wasn't told, but did not come to the surface for me until I was in the ninth grade. And during that time in Mississippi, all students had to take a civics class pertaining to the history of the county in which they lived in. And I was a young ninth grader, and you know, you're going to high school for the first time, it, you know, you're excited. But in this particular day, the teacher starts to talk about the county courthouse. And one of the things she said, there was a crazy lady. She burnt the county courthouse down, and we lost a lot of records during that time. And I said, mm. I said, a crazy, crazy woman during the day. I knew who the lady was. She's one of my great, great aunts. But part of the story that was left out was that Aunt Sarah burnt the courthouse down after they lynched her son. He did not die. They tied him up, then threw him in the lake, and he drowned. During this time, the men of the community retrieved his body. But she, go, she said she was going to hit them where it hurts them the most. They owned all the land, the property, burned the courthouse down. And that she did. They went after her, but there was a white man in the crowd. He said, don't bother. She's crazy. Because she told him that you all would never prosper me anything because my son never did anything to you. So as a ninth grader, when you're sitting in, in, in the class and you're hearing this story, and the only thing you hear is that, crazy woman. They didn't even refer to her as a black woman. Mm -hmm. They never referred to the fact that they had been a lynching. And you as a young African American lady, you said something is missing. So that makes you wonder how much of our history is missing yeah. or eliminated as we go along because of someone else's interpretation. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I shared with Sister Johnson, there are many accounts of lynching that went on as you sit around with the older with the older people who all yeah. now are gone. Yeah. And it, it sort of makes you sad that with them being gone, will the thoughts, the memories of those people that were lynched be gone also? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Conquerors and Revelation class presents our interpretation of a lynching play, <coughs> the name of which is A Day in the Life. These excerpts are from Caritha Mitchell's book, Living with Lynching. Between 1890 and 1930, lynchings were not hidden in the woods or executed only at night, but rather the time and location of the upcoming lynching 
were often listed in newspapers. For the members of the African American community in the early part of the 20th century, the play was the thing that allowed them to retain their collective consciousness of being both American citizens and people with dignity. In 1915, W.E.B. Du Bois created an NAACP drama committee hoping that these scripts would provide racial affirmation. Today, we honor our ancestors for their strength and courage during a time when faith came because of strength and courage was a word that others tried to strip away from us as a people. During slavery and for some time after, the picture of thriving family life is not portrayed in the lives of African Americans. Truth be told, there was a family structure then and it still exists today. Some of the men, these strong-minded, faithful heads of households, eventually made it. In their quest for family life and freedom, they were successful at getting away from the landowner. These are the men that brought their freedom and the freedom of their wife and children. Yet, lynching remained a painful part of an African American's life. The true sorrow was even our children were not spared. They must watch this ungodly scene. Oh, how our hearts ache and the never ending sea of tears that continue to fall for our loved ones. It was a day like other days. We were working. We were singing. And Lord knows we were praying. After a hard day, we relaxed. We talked to Mary. And we talked to Philip about their son, Solomon. We had not seen him in the field. And they let us know that he had run. <gasps> A gas filled the air. <gasps> we knew if he was caught, it would be another lynching. <laughs> One of our sons would be lynched. Yeah. Oh, God! How we prayed that Solomon would make it. Oh, God! How we prayed. <laughs> Mm. 
for it was still property of the land. educational system. Negative images on television. Absentee parents. Crime infested neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Unfair wages. Mm -hmm. Until the people are free. G -life. G -life. Black, Black lives now. Thank <laughs> you. 
said it, I've had him for problems. I've been glittery good. Yes, hey, 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 man. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Mm. Our ancestors, our, our forefathers, you know, here lately, our counterparts are constantly talking about the forefathers and how this country has gotten away from what the forefathers stand for. And, and uh, so we understand what they're talking about, but our forefathers, that's what we are celebrating today, mm -hmm. our forefathers. And, uh, you know, I, I was telling my husband, I say, as you look at this and realize the reasoning why behind lynching and all of that, it comes to the fact that that's why they have, they can't, they can't do anything with Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Because this is their greatest fear, mm -hmm. that one day, <coughs> A black man mm -hmm. will be out the country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and they they have done everything they possibly could yes, to yes. keep anything that he has That's on right. the yes. table off right. because they want him to have no legacy. Right. They, mm -hmm. they want him to be blank. If they if I tell I I ever said and I said all the time if there come a time that they can erase this part of history, mm -hmm. it will not be in the record. So be, I tell you, be aware of this unwritten history. Yeah. All of this stuff going in these computers and in right. these, yeah. uh, on these electronic things, mm -hmm. they can be, right. it can be hidden. If you don't know how to get in there and find it again, it will be gone. Right. Right. So be careful. Your written history is good. Keep up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Write it down. Yeah. Make it plain. Yeah. And then read it. Young people, know this. Because y'all are living in the, in the, in the time where uh, things don't look like they're bad as they have been, but if you just really yeah. look at yeah. it closely, yeah. 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 you look at it closely, you don't have a, a, a goal on what to go on to look at. But we who have been here yeah. can look at it and look behind the scenes of it and look at it closely and know what it is. Amen. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not lynching that they call it now. Mm. But they doing everything else. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. They 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 it's not that you're segregated from education now, but it's that they're giving you so little and so less of it that you still yes, yes. are not getting. That's right. That's right. So just remember that. This morning, uh before I go to before I turn it over to our pastor, uh also I like to get an offering. Uh from that get a because whatever we whatever we take up today, it goes to our college fund. It goes to our scholarship fund. Today is one of the programs that we give. Whatever the power hour gets goes to the scholarship fund for our children. For our power hour children. Amen. Amen. We got it. Okay. With that, while we're working on that, uh, I have our uh, academic rewards for our uh, students this morning. And this this time when you get your reward, you can thank your pastor, because last time he got it, he gave it for you to be for the doubling. But I don't double it on the first one. That's my rule. I don't want you to be a 1A wonder. <laughs> I want you to have something to strive for for the second Consistency. Mm -hmm. session. Yeah. Nine, six, nine, nine. Yeah. So, with that, I would like for um, all right, my young people to come forward. Ophelia Wilson. How much was the total this time, Sister Hill? Um, now, I don't have the total. Oh, Ophelia well. can tell you, she, I think Ophelia got, um, $14. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I can't, I don't have it in my head. Oh, okay. Well, that's actually, I just asked you the Ask them what they get. All right, what you? 
scholarship fund. We really need to get that up. We will be giving out uh, our scholarships uh, come uh, what May, June, and, and maybe even before that because kids will be going out to college. And, uh, and, and some folk will be re remaining in college. Amen. Amen. 
And um, I don't know about you. <laughs> and, and I don't know about you, but the last time I checked, uh, any little money is a, is a blessing when you're in school. Any little money is a blessing when you're in school. Still. Still. <laughs> I'm telling you, amen, amen. I want to just, um, um, I want to do two things before I just offer the benediction, amen. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this case or not, but back uh, in 2011, there was a man, James Anderson, um, that in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, who was um, lynched. Let's just say, let's just call it what it was. It was a modern day lynching. He was beaten. He was um, driven over a um, uh, pickup truck. And just in case the driver thought he might have missed him, he backed back to him. And then ran over him again. Backed over him and then run over him again. And of course, James Anderson died. He was um, um, close to his 49th birthday. And. Um, Johnson and the boys who did it were from Brandon, Mississippi. I, uh, right, oh, okay. Mississippi. From Brandon, right outside. Yep, they were they were outside of Jackson, and uh, they were going uh, nigger hunting. Mm. That's that was the term they used. They go to ja Africa, which is the term they use for now describing Jackson, Mississippi, mm. a predominantly black city in, in in the state of Mississippi. So they went. They used to go out and just you know beat up on black folks. And this time, of course, it resulted in this horrific death. They were caught thanks to uh, video cameras that were in the parking lot that caught everything on tape. Now, 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 think about that for a moment. If it had not been for those cameras, they would have not been convicted. I guarantee you, they would have not been convicted. They would have been, uh, if, if they thought they had the right suspects, There'd be no proof, and, and everything would have just gone on as usual. They were um, sentenced this week to the, the trial, and then they pleaded guilty and all of that, and they were sentenced this week by an African-American judge, wow. Wow. Uh, a United States attorney, a United States um, um, district judge by the name of Carlton Reeves. He was recently appointed by... President Barack Obama All right. for this position. Only uh, the second African American United States District Judge in the entire state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. The only second one. Wow. Now, this says something else that I did not prepare to say, but it just hit me. And this is why elections are, are important yeah. and have consequences. That's right. You need people in office that will appoint folk that is at least, at least knowledgeable and maybe even understanding of the situations in which uh, you and I face. Yeah. So Judge Carlton Reeves is one of the uh, one of those judges who, uh, the United States District Judge, who then said uh, this um, when he spoke. I mean, who did send us to people. And what I want to do is on my blog, Red Race and Religion, if you want to read the whole thing. But I just want to read some, uh, you know, every time a, a judge sentence, when they offer a sentence, they offer a speech. They talk about, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, especially if it's a horrific crime and, and if it's a nationally, uh, um, uh, a national type of event, which this was. So what I want to do is just read uh, just a couple of paragraphs of this powerful speech in this sentencing. Remember, everybody, the families have talked, the defendant's family has talked, people have just, you know, um, poured out, the defendants have said their, uh, their, their, their piece, and, and now finally you get the judge and about ready uh, to sentence. Um, where do I want to start? Let's see here. What is so disturbing, so shocking, so numbing, is that these nigger hunts were pepper, uh, perpetrated by our children, mm -hmm. students who live among us, educated in our public schools, mm -hmm. our private academies, students who play football, lined up on the same side of scrimmage with black teammates, mm -hmm. average students and other students, 
kids who work during summers, during school and in the summers, kids who now have full-time jobs, some of them who are even unemployed, yeah. some who are pursuing higher education, and the court, uh, and the court believes that each had dreams to pursue. Mm -hmm. These children were from two-parent homes, mm -hmm. some who were children of divorced parents. And yes, even some raised by a single parent. No doubt, they all had loving parents and loving families. In letters received on his behalf, Dallin Butler, whose out, uh, outing on the night of June 26 was not his first, has been described as a fine young man, a caring person, a well-mannered man, who is truly remorseful they want to move on with his life. <laughs> Very respectful. Good man, good person, a lover, lovable, kind-hearted teddy bear who stands in front of bullies and who is now ashamed of what he did. Butler's family is a mixed race family. For the last 15 wow. years, it has consisted of an African-American stepfather and stepsister plus his mother and two sisters. The family, according to him, the stepfather, understandably is sad and heartbroken. I asked a question earlier, but what could transform these young adults into the violent creatures their victims saw? It was nothing the victims did, not championing any cause, Political, social, economic, nothing they did. Not a wolf whistle, not a supposed crime, nothing they did. There is absolutely no doubt that in the view of the court, the victims were targeted because of their race. And I want to read one more paragraph. Mm. So powerful. Um, today we take another step he says, away from Mississippi's tortured past. We move further away from the abyss. Indeed, Mississippi is a place and a state of mind. That's how he started the whole uh, speech. And those who think they know about her people and her past will also understand that her story has not been completely written. Mississippi has a present and a future. That present and future has promised, as demonstrated by the work of officers within the state and federal agencies, black and white, male and female, in this Mississippi, they work together to advance the rule of law. Having learned from Mississippi's inglorious past, these officials know that in advancing the rule of law, the criminal justice system must operate without regard to race, creed, or color, this is the strongest way Mississippi can reject those notions, those ideals which brought us here today. And part of the new Mississippi, part of the new Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, the United States, and indeed the entire world, is by stating the obvious that is on the table, that race has made a huge difference in our wealth, in the perceptions and a whole lot of other stuff that uh, that we are still battling with today. If we want to get from the past, we got to recognize the past. Yeah. And somebody got to say that yes, that happened. And yes, I'll affirm your feelings about that. What we have tried to demonstrate here today is that past. When Kim was up here talking about lynching and when you were seeing the lynched bodies, we were so, do you understand? The American, yeah. the America was so up in arms that ISIS burnt a person alive yeah. Yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Put them in a cage and just set them on fire yeah. and watched them burn, videotaped and uploaded to a website and people saw that. Mm -hmm. Without an outrage, without acknowledging that you burn human yeah. beings yeah. on trees yeah. <laughs> and poles and in ditches mm. like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, the last piece I was going to say is what about today? Mm. Why are we talking about modern day lynchings today? Mm. 
Well, let me give you five bullet points to take with you about yesterday's lynchings and about today's lynchings when it involved police shootings. This is why we and a whole lot of other people are talking about it this way. First of all, it involved, the lynchings involved black bodies. Yeah, yeah. And it was not, they were not lynched because they were black. Stop putting the burden on the victim when you say that. Mm -hmm. They were lynched because white folk had a problem with blackness. Yeah. Number two, mm -hmm. it was state sanctioned yeah. violence. Yeah. A lot of people said, well, the, the, the lynchings back then were just mobs of people, it wasn't state involved until you looked at the mob. When you start noticing the sheriffs, yeah. the deputies, yeah. the police officers <laughs> themselves were part of the mob. Yeah. Under the cloak of the shield, mm -hmm. they perpetrated this violence, state-sanctioned violence. And every time a police officer shoots an unarmed black person, yeah. we are saying that in, in, indirectly, that we okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because it's state-sponsored uh, sponsored violence. And then, again, when we peel back the onion, oh, my bad, oh, we do pay your salary. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Tupac said it a long time ago, mm -hmm. that we are subsidizing our own brutality mm -hmm. by paying your salary. Mm -hmm. He put that in a rap in 1993. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Third, trumped up charges. Yeah. Yeah. Ida B. Wells did a masterful work on unearthing the charges. You know why she was so successful in putting all that into her pamphlets? Because they were public knowledge. They were put in newspapers. Yeah, yeah. And the number one reason why a lot of black men, at least, were lynched was because of white women. Yeah. And the yeah. whole infatuation yeah. Yeah. of they looked at a white woman wrong, they whistled at a white woman, they did this with a white woman, and that was just a rude to get support and sympathy from folk to lynch. Trumped up charges are still going on today. He had a gun. Yeah. It looked like a gun. Like he was running. I thought he was going for a gun. Yeah. One of the things that I try to do on my Facebook page as a educational measure is that I am showing all of these police shootings that's going on all across the country. And people ask, wow, are you still showing all a whole lot of police shootings? I'm saying, you ought to ask me, why am I showing a whole lot of police shootings? Why am I able to show a whole lot of police shootings? And yet, here's another one. Different time, different space and place. Number four, the bodies were always exposed to the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially now in the social media world, we can see up close and personal the bodies that are slain in our streets. Black bodies being shot are almost like snuff films. If you're familiar with a snuff film, a snuff film is a porno film where a death occurs and it's shared with everybody else. We are seeing mass murder on video. Trumped up charges, exposed to the community. Do you know what happened in lynchings? The reason why we have those pictures today you, they took them and they put them on postcards and send them through the U.S. mail. Yes. And a lynching today, and you have little kids smiling, looking at burnt and dead bodies. Mm -hmm. And last thing, why this is a connection and why we're talking about it. And I hope you, you just give me a little leadway because this is something near and dear to my own ministry and to my own heart. Because we got to do something about this. The last connection is no convictions. Mm -hmm. There was hardly any convictions until the 1990s uh, when Mississippi finally started going back over some old cases. We didn't know, you could just do anything yeah. you wanted to yeah. knowing that you could not, you would honest. never get convicted. <laughs> Forget in today's um, um, lynching about convictions, we can't even get indictments. Yeah. An indictment is just saying you got enough evidence, evidence to go to trial. Yeah. 
So this is why we're making the connection. This is why black lives matter. It's almost, as a rhetorical trope, black lives matter, it's almost a defeatist trope. Because when I have to tell somebody yeah. that black lives matter, yeah. I'm already battling, yeah. trying to get you to at least recognize the fact that black lives matter. But we got to keep saying it, and we got to affirm it, and then maybe, and I heard it in, the, in, in our program, that then we can begin to understand that Black Lives Matter not only when we're talking to other folk, but when we're talking to each other as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's it. That's it. Right. Yes. So when we talk about, let's just get real. So when we talk about domestic abuse, men, Black Lives Matter, when Black women's lives matter. When we talking about children and abuse, Black children's lives matter. My black brother's life matter. Yeah, my black yeah, sister yeah. life matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we are, you know, talking about, you know, mm. trying to play game and run game and using uh, 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 slavery masters tropes and strategies in order to trick and to uh, put people in an oppressive state, we got to remember black lives matter. matter. Yeah. Amen. All over the place. Amen. Now, I'm not going to get up here and talk about black on black crime without first uh, having a discussion on white on white crime and any other crime because well, well, white well. And, uh, crime is crime and crime right. happens amongst people that you know and you know, you know that, that, that thing. But I would say this, when we talk about uh, uh, crime in general, if we will begin to understand that all lives matter, mm -hmm. all lives matter. That is just a theological understanding. All lives matter. We can be better off for it. Because even when blacks kill, blacks, blacks are not only indicted, but many times convicted. If you don't believe me, go to 201 tomorrow. What we are trying to do is to get some indictments and some convictions when state-sponsored violence creeps in. No need to march on a black on black crime, that's going to be solved, that's going to be convicted, or somebody will be convicted. Yeah, somebody. No need. No need to bring Holder here. No need to bring Sharpton or anybody here. No need to march. No, God, that's going to happen because the people we pay to make that happen going to do their job. And anybody who has been around the criminal justice system knows that. Yeah. But when certain people do it, that's what we're talking about. Nobody should be able to get away with murder. Yeah. Especially yeah. after the M.E. declares it a homicide. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Black Lives Matter. I want to thank the survivors and everybody for this Black History program. This has to be one of our better ones, really. And I am just so thrilled that everybody could. And one day, our kids wonderful, too. Our kids. That Adrian Jackson just came up here and just spoke to us. My, my, my. And the singing. Yes. Yes. And, and our conquerors and our. Uh, 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 revelation, and uh, boy, my God, y'all gonna get some Academy Awards. I tell you, Sister Hill, Sister Hill, you you wanna come in? You wanna jump in, jump in? And, oh, as I was rolling, go ahead. <laughs> I just want our uh, resident artist to sing. Oh yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What we do with the painting she had? Oh, okay, good, good, good. That's right, our resident artist, our artist in residence. Uh, we gonna call you that, Gabrielle. You're gonna be our first artist in residence. Amen. It's never going anywhere. I am so, so pleased and so happy. As a professor who teaches this on a regular basis, 
as somebody who is a scholar in this stuff, who researches it and all, I am just so glad of the time and the energy you yeah. guys put into, you know, getting this done. And I'm just looking uh, forward to next year. Um, yeah. Bigger and better. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Somebody yeah. already said the theme is going to be black power. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Amen. Yeah. That, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Let us stand. We're going to get out of here. Yeah. The time, as they say, is nigh. <laughs> now, it would have been perfect if we had some uh, uh, neck bones. And, now, this would have been a perfect day for some song from right. Right, right after the limb would have been kicked right in. Hey, <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we did have the neck bones going with us tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Don't say no more. <laughs> Let us pray. First of all, Lord, we thank you for the offering that is lifted and received in your name. In the name of Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. God of our weary years, God of our silent yes, yes. tears, who has brought us this far yes, along yes. the way. Yes. By thy might, lead us into the light. Yes. Keep us in the path forever, we pray. Lord, we thank you, thank you. Thank you. for the history. Yes. Lord God, it was tough, it was rough. Yes. Still is, Lord. Yes. Lord. But we thank you for the journey, Lord God. Yes. Yes. Not for all the stuff that happens, mm -hmm. but we are still in a thankful spirit that we can, that we somehow, some way begin to understand it mm -hmm. yeah. yes. and govern ourselves accordingly. Yes, Lord. Lord God, it's a painful reminder for some of us who lived through some of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. So, Lord God, we say now, as we move forward, Lord God, help us to have a better understanding. Help us to be able to share what we learned today with us. Yes, yes. Help us to be able, Lord God, to live this piece of our history. Yes. Not to be ashamed, mm -hmm. but to be empowered from it. Yes, Lord. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Yes. And as we leave this place, we ask that you go with us and act yes. through us. Yes. Lead us and guide us and keep us. Yes. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen.